Hi everyone, welcome to the D.6 transport of respiratory gases um, video. Okay, so I always find that this topic is uh, fairly difficult and it's is quite hard to get your head around. Look at it. Um, but um, once you have got your head around pause it, it, it does make a lot of sense. Okay, so to start with, we need to know a little bit about how carbon dioxide moves around the body. So it can move around the body in the blood in different forms. So it's either just dissolved as carbon dioxide, but there's not actually a huge amount uh, that travels like this. It can also be um, bound to plasma proteins. Um, you learnt about the production of plasma proteins in the liver in um, option D, part three. Uh, and it can also be, carbon dioxide can also be um, transported as bicarbonate or hydrogen carbonate ions. Uh, and they are then dissolved in the plasma. Um, and this is good because um, the bicarbonate ions are more soluble and therefore less toxic. So we only transport a small amount of carbon dioxide in the blood dissolved because it's actually toxic. So here we can convert it into bicarbonate to make it less toxic. And you've got the uh, reversible equations here for that. Uh, I don't know why those twos are upside down. Apologies. Um, okay, so we're going to look at the oxygen dissociation curve. So the oxygen dissociation curve shows the saturation of um, hemoglobin with oxygen. So essentially, like the percentage of oxygen that it, in the blood that is bound to hemoglobin or the percentage of hemoglobin that has oxygen bound to it. Um, and that's up the side of the graph here. And we've also got the partial pressure of oxygen along the bottom, which is essentially just the concentration of oxygen in the environment. Uh, the oxygen dissociation curve is always kind of this shape as well. And your your normal, in inverted commas, oxygen dissociation curve always looks like this one on the graph. Sorry, it's a bit blurry. Um, okay, so hemoglobin is uh, the oxygen transport protein. Obviously, we find hemoglobin in red blood cells. We have four hemoglobin molecules in each red blood cell. And hemoglobin is a quaternary protein, which means that it's... Um, a number of tertiary structures joined together to produce one protein. It is, in fact, four uh, tertiary structures, um, two alpha globin chains and two beta globin chains, but you don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, the dissociation curve, as I said, shows the percentage of the hemoglobin in the blood that has oxygen bound to it at different partial pressures, so at different concentrations of oxygen. Um, the partial pressure means concentration of oxygen, and uh, we call a curve that shape a sigmoid curve because it's an S shape. Um, okay, so the first oxygen, because you've got four uh, hemoglobin molecules in every red blood cell, the first oxygen, the first O2 that binds to the hemoglobin finds it quite difficult to load on. So we call oxygen binding to the hemoglobin loading. So it loads on um, and it, diso or it associates when it loads on and then it dissociates later off and kind of later on and it offloads. Um, the first oxygen finds it difficult to load onto the hemoglobin just because of the, the shape of the hemoglobins. However, once the first oxygen has uh, loaded, it slightly changes the shape of the other hemoglobin molecules and it's much easier for the second and third oxygen. So you can see here that your sigmoid uh, curve, This, I mean, if this was flatter, it would, would be better and show you it better, but um, it's more difficult here and then it should go up more rapidly here for the second and third oxygens uh, to load on. So up until like 25%, that's when you've got essentially one oxygen molecule, uh, one O2 molecule loaded onto your hemoglobin, and then 50% saturation, your hemoglobins have two O2 molecules, 75% they have three, and then obviously up here 100% they have four um, O2 molecules. Um, the fourth oxygen struggles to load as well because of the shape of the final hemoglobin molecule, and that's why the curve plateaus a tiny bit. And you'll notice that the curve doesn't actually go up to 100%. So this is the percentage saturation of all of the hemoglobin in the blood. So um, it's very unusual uh, for every single hemoglobin to have four O2 molecules bound to it. So that's why it never really gets up to 100%.
uh, and then the word affinity, so that will come up quite a lot in the next few slides. Affinity refers to the tendency of the molecules to combine. So if there's a high affinity, it means that the oxygen is happy to load onto the haemoglobin. If there's a low affinity, it means that the oxygen uh, generally dissociates. So um, if we've got a high concentration of oxygen in the environment, usually the affinity for the haemoglobin is high, so the oxygen loads on. And if there's a low concentration of oxygen in the environment, the affinity is low, so the oxygen um, unloads. Okay, um, so try and get your head around that first slide, and we'll talk about this here. So this here is something called the Bohr shift. Now. As you exercise, uh, we already know this, more oxygen is required by the muscle cells for respiration in order to make the energy for the um, muscle contraction to occur. This also, in turn, means that more carbon dioxide is made. So the more carbon dioxide um, is made, the more has to be released into the blood. And as you release the carbon dioxide into the blood, it increases the acidity. An increase in acidity obviously decreases pH because a low pH is acidic and a high pH is alkaline. So keep following. Um, the increase in carbon dioxide in the blood causes the affinity for oxygen to decrease. So it, the more carbon dioxide in the blood, the lower the affinity. And that means that the oxygen is going to want to dissociate with the haemoglobin. Now, this is a good thing because if you imagine that you are a haemoglobin molecule. In the lungs, there's a nice high affinity for oxygen, so therefore, uh, because there's lots of oxygen, so therefore the oxygen loads on, and that's great. Now, the haemoglobin molecule then moves around the body, carrying its oxygen. When it gets to the muscle tissue, it recognises that there's lots of carbon dioxide in the environment. And if there's lots of carbon dioxide in the environment, the haemoglobin molecule thinks, well, if there's lots of carbon dioxide, there must be lots of respiration occurring, and therefore the cells must need more oxygen. So I'm going to give up my oxygen molecule. So the affinity for oxygen decreases in areas where there's a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, this can be shown on the graph as the curve shifting to the right. Uh, when we call this the Bohr shift. I don't think I've written that anywhere, but Bohr is spelled B-O-H-R. So the Bohr shift is your um, dissociation curve moving to the right. Now this here is quite self-explanatory if you've understood that uh, this box here. So the ventilation rate, obviously, um, as respiration increases and the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood increases, there's an increased need for oxygen so therefore the body increases ventilation or breathing rate and this is new information the chemoreceptors in the walls of the carotid artery so the carotid artery is found in the neck they detect the changes in the carbon dioxide concentration and then they send messages to the brain in order to increase the ventilation rate if there's a, a high concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood so the body's always uh, monitoring the levels of carbon dioxide and if there's too much carbon dioxide then the ventilation or the breathing rate will increase and um, this is controlled by the medulla oblongata in the brain and knowing the medulla oblongata controls ventilation rate is quite a nice um, one mark uh, multiple choice question okay so again if you understood up here then this is kind of straightforward so um, if the blood pH falls below 7.35, therefore it gets more acidic, then the ventilation rate increases because naturally the body recognises that there must be more carbon dioxide. Um, and there's also increased uh, hydrogen ions in the blood, which then decrease the pH. Um, and the, the way that we can raise pH is the kidney releases um, hydrogen ions in order to raise pH and secretes bicarbonate ions in order to increase pH. Uh, and then, just as kind of a, a, a final uh, for this slide, um, a final summary, the curve shifts to the right if there's increased carbon dioxide, increased acidity, lowered pH or increased ventilation rate. Um, and they all cause the same thing, it's all the same. Okay, moving our curve to the left. 
So we're going to use fetal haemoglobin as an example. So fetal haemoglobin in a fetus is different to adult haemoglobin. And the reason it's different is because the um, it's exposed to less oxygen in the environment. It can only get oxygen from the mother's blood. So the fetal haemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than adult haemoglobin. So this is our fetal haemoglobin here. So it means that because it has a higher affinity, the oxygen is more likely to load onto the haemoglobin at lower partial pressures. Um, oh, and then I've explained this final point here. So this then shifts the curve to the left. So if you're talking about an increased affinity, the curve shifts to the left and you are talking about um, loading on. If you're talking about unloading, because more oxygen is required, then your curve will shift to the right in general. Um, so other things that cause the curve to shift to the left, fetal haemoglobin, altitude, because there's less oxygen in the environment, and myoglobin also has a curve shift to the left. You can see that down here. Um, now, myoglobin is a protein found in the muscles and it has a really, really high affinity for oxygen. So it's kind of like your muscles plan B um, for oxygen. So the myoglobin just hangs around there and mops up lots of oxygen. And when your muscles are really, really desperate, the myoglobin will then give it up. So the myoglobin can mop up all of the oxygen, even when there's not very much in the environment. So that's really useful as kind of a contingency plan for your uh, muscles before they have to start respiring anaerobically. And then again, altitude, there's lower um, oxygen, low partial pressure of oxygen in the environment. And animals that live at altitude have um, adapted haemoglobin that becomes saturated at a lower partial pressure. There's also some populations of humans that have slightly different haemoglobin that has um, a higher affinity for oxygen at lower partial pressures because those communities have li lived at altitude. Okay, finally, we've got some stuff about smoking and emphysema. Now, if you get asked about this in the exam, the likelihood is that it'll be data analysis questions because um, there's loads of really nice data for this. So people never used to realise that smoking was linked to so many diseases and therefore everyone smoked socially. Um, no, not everyone, but the majority of people smoked socially uh, quite happily. However, when it became apparent that actually smoking caused various cancers, um, that people started to stop, stop smoking, obviously, for health reasons. And you can see here, this is the amount of cigarettes smoked per year from 1900 to the year 2000. So it increased rapidly and then um, it decreased uh, fairly rapidly as well. Um, smoking can cause a number of cancers, but it can also cause emphysema. And emphysema causes the walls of the alveoli to break down, which decreases, sorry, there's a lot of spelling mistakes in here, which decreases the surface area for gas exchange. Um, now, the symptoms of emphysema are generally shortness of breath after people uh, do very little exercise, so like climbing a staircase and they would be very short of breath. Um, and other things can cause emphysema as well, so uh, irritants, and uh, they think that air pollution could also cause it. I think the research is still ongoing. Um, and then here you can see that you've got some lung tissue micrographs, and you must be able to identify the different parts of the lung tissue. So you've got some red blood cells here, handily stained red, obviously in the exam it would be black and white, and you've got your um, type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes that you should know from chapter 6. You've also here got a capillary. Now we know that this is a capillary because we can see the red blood cells inside it. So just be aware that you need to be able to recognize these. And that's the end, I think.